tried to try got thousands of letters from people, and then we developed an application procedure, you know, for people. And it was interesting because uh, the application procedure involved not only knowing how to stitch, that was just the beginning. It was actually whether or not the person, particularly women, had a life structure that would support focused work. And for many women, it came greatly in conflict with their families and their family demands. And they, even though they had tremendous stitchers, you know, they couldn't even eke out 10 hours a week to work on something of their own. And it was really, uh, you know, I was saying last night that, you know, during the dinner party, people said, well, this is fantastic. They worked in my studio, but now I have to go back to my real life. And one of the things I really wanted to do and did do in the birth project was to have the art be in their real lives. So that because the pieces were executed in their houses, they impacted mm -hmm. on their lives in a way and on their communities, which was, was sort of like these mini centers, you know, and then the needle workers had to deal with people's attitudes towards women, people's attitudes towards art. It was fascinating, fascinating mm -hmm. the things that happened. And I think that in that way, the art reached out, you know, and built internally in community, which I, which I, I would believe in. What's your feeling about a, a museum like the Women's Museum in Washington? That's the right. Women's Arts. Would you want to be, have a dinner party at a place like that? Well, first of all, the dinner party won't fit there. Second of all, I, uh, how do I feel about it? I feel, um, I feel like we're at a very early stage as women in discussing how to institutionalize. Okay, I mean, we really haven't even begun to have that discussion. And the absence of housing for the dinner party is actually an indication of the fact that we have not begun to have that discussion. That the dinner party could have been uh, around for so long and influenced so many people, and yet women are unable to come together and house it is a statement about our, the absence of both dialogue and um, commitment to institutionalizing. So uh, do I wish that all the museums in the world showed women's art? Yes. Do I? Yes. Do I wish that uh, the museums were equitable and that they were not racist and sexist? Yes. But wishing doesn't make it so. In the meantime, there's an enormous amount of art by women that is not being preserved. And I believe that what Billy Holiday committed herself to, which is to, you know, starting the process of preserving women's art, deserves to be supported. I don't feel she has to do it the way I would do it. I mean, she's, she's her, and she put her money where her mouth is, and she gets to do it the way she believes, you know? And um, I think it's admirable, I think the way she's built it, you know, from grassroots. She has the largest museum membership in America and the third largest in the world, do you know that? Which is a statement about the enormous need there is. And what I would say is that instead of, there's been a lot of criticism of her, I think it's, uh, it's unfair. And uh, I think if you don't like the way she's doing it, do another one. You know, it would be preposterous to think that there could be one museum to take care of all of men's art. So why we think that the Women's Museum should be adequate to take care of the history of women's art, it's not so. I mean, there should be multiple institutions, and we should be discussing among ourselves what kind of institutions we want, and what model of institution we want, and do we want segregated institutions, and if we don't want segregated institutions, what values do we want the institution to have, and how do you make that? And I mean, we should be engaged in a level of dialogue way beyond, you know, what does it mean to be a woman at this point? But because it's been so hard for us to, you know, stop inventing the wheel, because you know, we are still having that abortion fight all over, you know, it's very difficult to move forward or pass it on, as I was talking about last night. So, do you see that maybe, do you see sort of placing the dinner party as the beginning of, of that kind of a structure? I mean, it seems to me that if the dinner party is placed, I don't know, I mean, it just feels to me like there's nothing. This, this is the most basic work. Absolutely. You know, and I it, it needs more. to be placed. I mean, I everybody more. needs to be able to see it. It's I crazy. More. But I mean, what does it say that it's not? And again, you know, 
uh, and, you know, my talking last night about the difference between personal power and structural power came out of our conversation at dinner when I was asking women about how they see power, since this was the theme mm -hmm. that, you know, people chose for the weekend. And it was clear that, uh, I think as women, very few of us have begun to understand mm -hmm. the difference between personal and structural power and have thought that becoming empowered means developing personal power. Well, great, that's step number one. That's like, that's getting you into the first step. And then there is how do you enact that power in the world? And that's where we're extremely um, early in the empowerment process. And I don't know the dinner party, I think it's really important to understand the dinner party could absolutely go down. There's no question about it. So, you know, then you think about, well, how, when women make decisions, like, What's more important? If I make another work, if I become a, a this or a that, and I make, I get the chance to do another work or do this or do that, or to create the basis for a new future. I mean, <laughs> you know. So I mean, it has to do with the choices, and you know, we have looked at our choices by and large in terms of personal empowerment. That that's the end all and be all of, of our goals as women. It's personal empowerment. I guess people feel that they have a chance at that. In the right, right. Because, because we haven't had it is yeah. why. Of course, because we haven't had it. So, you know, on the other, and also because women have put aside their own personal development for so many other reasons, that it's, you know, then they go, well, why should I do it again? And, you know, that's understandable. But these are things that we should be discussing, I think. Well, what does it mean in terms of, you know, uh, my personal empowerment against the future, and you know, what does it mean if the dinner party goes down as a symbol for, you know, our, all of our empowerment? I mean, those are all issues I think would be wonderful if we were debating. I've lots of other questions about people don't. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. What would you think about putting in a place like this that people reflect the money and the place to be? A dinner party is a pilgrimage, would be a pilgrimage site wherever it is. It has been a pilgrimage site. I don't think it matters too much where it is. I think people will go to see it. I mean, as you know, when it was in Chicago, people got into buses and went to Chicago for Ames. I mean, people have gone wherever it was, people went to see it. So I, I don't think it, I think what matters is that it's in boxes in, in, in storage. I think that's the single most discouraging thing. Because what does that mean in terms of our whole effort? in the culture and to and to institutionalize our gains and to pass them on and to participate in the future and the shaping of the future and you know I mean that that's uh, that's the seems to me needs to be the goal here. So I, I don't have any particular feelings but I want to hear that. Sure I would have loved it on the mall. That sounded like a great idea, you know, but I mean now the word Washington DC, if anybody raises it I go the other direction. I go, no way. I mean, those guys came. I mean, when that started, I go, all I want is to get out of the line of fire. Because they wrecked your life. I mean, there was an article in the Boston Globe about one of the NEA4, I think Holly Hughes or Erin Finley, I think it was Holly Hughes. You know, and her life's been wrecked as an artist. I mean, she has not made a piece of work since the NEA, since she got, you know, denied that grant. She's been doing nothing but fighting. And also, she's been leperized in the art community. You know, for me, who, if, I, if I don't make art, I might as well not breathe. It was really terrifying. So, anywhere but Washington is <laughs> my answer. Yes. Um, you may already cover this. This may be like an obvious question, but it, it would seem as though if you can't find the mountain to instill a work on, why not create the mountain? And what, what's the possibility of using the networking situation, people that have already been impacted by it, and people's talents, professional talents, to find a place to buy it and create it? Well, I mean, I think that, of course, the, uh, the you know, wonderful dream would be that a housing for the dinner party would be like Chart or one of the medieval cathedrals where everybody brought a brick, but one mustn't forget that they brought a brick in the context of the Catholic Church, which owned the land and paid for the structures, you know. So I think that's that thing about uh, uh, structural or institutional power. It's beyond. You, you, it's important to understand sort of where uh, women are in terms of money 
and empowerment, for example. And um, there was a woman in Cleveland who was the organizer of the effort to bring the dinner party to Cleveland. They raised $250,000 in Cleveland. They refurbished an entire building. And in fact, that building is now an art center in Cleveland. And they made, from, recouped all their money, and they made $50,000 out of it, which, with which they started a women's foundation, which has funded a lot of projects, OK? 10 years goes by. I go back to Cleveland. This woman is sitting in a room where I'm talking about uh, the difficulties around the dinner parties right after the thing that happened in Washington. And I was talking about how baffling it is to me that people have not come forward to just do it themselves, having done this already. She said it was like a lightning bolt hit her in the back of the room. She goes, I couldn't possibly do such a thing. I go, Mickey, you already did such a thing. Why can't you imagine doing it a little more? She went, it took her a year to integrate the idea that this was something she could even think about, make an institution. This is outside of our framework yet as women. We have not, very few of us, you know, are brought up thinking, well, I can make that museum. I mean, I could just start a museum. I mean, a lot of my friends, including women, have been involved in the making of museums. But it's just new to us. We have, I mean, it's really, really suck. How many women in this room think they could start a museum? <laughs> oh, yeah? Two of you? Younger women. <laughs> <laughs> you know how? I think so. Do you? Huh? I grew up in sort of that But um, I have to apologize. I didn't get to come last night. And I think some of what you're talking about is a little vague to me, and I'm curious why the dinner party can't be placed because of the size or because of um, just the, the um, just the cost of maintaining it. Then no, the dinner party is always been revenue producing. That's nothing to do with it. So what what's the fundamental reason that the I don't know. Do you want to address it for me? <laughs> After hearing my talk. That's nice. Does anybody want to address why they think the dinner party is not being held? I think it's for political, lack of understanding, lack of knowledge, narrow-mindedness, fear. I think somebody is a great part of it. Why is the ERA been passed? Mm -hmm. Why is abortion being uh, reversed? First of all, personal needs, 
when it comes to making art. We can't do it. We can do it. And that isn't. Uh, I, I agree with that. I don't think I'm very, with that. I'm very serious about that. I think young women must understand that as long as the world, and it has been run since the beginning of time, seems like. Yes. Like, no, it's only like the last five thousand years. Yes, recorded. You just have to change it. It's not that you want to change it. But it also has to do with understanding the world the way it is and okay. coming out of a kind of infantilization and a kind of naivety and a kind of um, childishness, which, you know, I mean, I, I struggled with too. I mean, the world is a, a lot different than I thought it was when I was talking about that last night, you know, when I thought by addressing women's issues, for example, was an end-all and be-all, and it's only recently that I've really understood our situation in a larger context and understood it in terms of the fabric of inequality and injustice on the planet. And that, you know, there's a huge, as Robert Lifton says, we're faced with, as human beings, the prospect of a huge ethical task, which is the transformation of our planet. And, you know, our struggles as women are part of that. And there's a lot of uh, the, the nature of power and the way it's been defined on the planet and the way it's maintained and controlled on the planet is not interested in that kind of change. So they, you know, that's why it's the Green Party House because it's not in the interest of the existing institutions and power structure as it exists now to promote the idea that white male history is not universal history. And the dinner party cast down on that. The dinner party says if there's another history, if there's a history of women, that means that what we've been taught as universal history is not true. So that must mean there's other stories too. And guess what? There are other stories. There are many other stories. Don't you think now with the this like age of PC that it's kind of, I mean, I was kind of surprised to think that Time Magazine even talk about the other side of Columbus's issue, that there are groups that are making gains and showing the other side of the other histories that are out there. Yes, and actually the story of what's happened to the dinner party should act as a warning to those groups that at the point at which they want their these other stories institutionalized and preserved, they're going to encounter the same kind of resistance that the dinner party is resisting. It has encountered, the dinner party encountered resistance at the point at which it was going to enter history. That's when it encountered enormous, unbelievable and it's caught us all by surprise. I was just as surprised as you are. I go, well, you know, I mean, the dinner party pays dues. Give it a break. You know? <laughs> the girls need a resting place now. They can't just keep traveling around the world. <laughs> They're all getting old and shabby and tired and needlework needs a little, you know, cleaning. <laughs> well, the problem with getting into industry is breaking a set of barriers, the biggest one being I got control of it. You can't come in. Absolutely. Um, you've got two things. The, the content is what's so powerful in moving people. I mean, the art moves them, but, but the content is what's scary. The art, if they can all enjoy the art uh, on some level, if they can avoid the, and we learn how to avoid content in this culture. Right. But you've got two parts of content <coughs> going on at the same time that I have. Mean, or, or two parts that I think are really interesting in terms of their importance. The historical part, the part you go back and draw on things whether it's the Holocaust, women in the world, whatever it is. At which point you've got to deal with a set of uh, approaching it another way. So like when somebody brings up Columbus, people don't want to believe there's another possibility. Right. And you've got people, also if you want to read about Columbus, there are 600 books probably in this library about Columbus. You can get the facts down easily. You're looking for facts that aren't there or facts that are so controversial. So you've got the problem in history of how do you select the facts you get and people want to criticize you. Well, the way history's been written, right? But I'm saying it's hard for you to get a hold of your facts on one hand. On the other hand, you do another thing, which is to say, making myth. You, in, and in the most positive sense, you're inventing a new future and inventing a kind of past history, trying to create a new way of looking at it. But actually, what that suggests is, is that history, as we've learned it, was created. Absolutely, but it's hard to learn those both at the same time. Yes, because we've been taught about, that it was it's true. It's true. Right, some of the people in the dinner, I remember walking through the dinner party. A friend of mine dragged me to it. I was in San Francisco. She says, you got to see this. You don't want to see the Chinese ceramics here. Please. And, and she took me. And I'm walking through it thinking, wow, yes, yes. Who's that? <laughs> you know, this is all wrong. And they're almost all white. <laughs> you know. But the fact is, part of the history, here are these historical people. And then here are these 
more mythical people, and then you go on in the birth project, and you can do each of these things, making them the same, inventing new visions at the same time you're trying to catch the old ones. I'm sure you get criticism about not knowing enough about India, not knowing enough about this African goddess or something. At the same okay, time, every criticism you can possibly imagine. <laughs> That's something I know I have to imagine. How, how do you deal with this? Well, for a long time I felt like one of those dolls, you know, you punch those dolls and come back up and get punched again. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, it terrified me when it happened around the dinner party because it was the first time, I mean, first of all, the idea of a work of art stimulating that level of dialogue that went on. And there were literally thousands of articles. Everybody had an opinion on the dinner party. And uh, it scared me half to death. Now, I think nothing better can happen because I realize that that's every art. I mean, what is the function of art? is to stimulate a level of dialogue in the community. And so that's OK, you know? When people get engaged like that, and they scream and yell, and you know, it means that they've been touched and they care. And like. A lot of times now I know that a lot of times what happens is that particularly when people haven't thought very deeply on the subject, they say very stupid things. So a lot of it I blow off. For example, when the birth project first started coming out into the world, I really realized that somebody, the person who wrote this, had simply not thought about this subject very much at all because he wrote that I was responsible. I presented all these women laying on their backs giving birth. I was responsible for degrading women. I go, what? He's giving me credit for the whole history of OBGYN. It's not my fault that's what happened in medicine and the history of birth is, is that women lost control of the birthing process and were rendered passive on the table flat. So he, the guy says it's me, I did. Just all by myself, I degraded women. I go, no, he just never thought about this subject. That's why he's saying this. Is that He's in a very early stage of thinking about it. So now, you know, I don't like it. I hate being criticized. I want everybody to like my work, but you know, I'm a big girl. Let me, let me push it a little further. I mean, it, it's a hard thing to do. Um, you describe, um, you describe Indian when you showed that shit in the Yeah, Mother India. All right. Uh, Purda still exists in India. It's a, it's, it's a marginal thing in India. Yeah, but it, it, it certainly exists in, the, in, in uh, uh, Pakistan and Bangladesh and the Muslim countries, yes, okay. India is actually the third largest Muslim country at the same time as largely Hindu. I'm saying when people push you with things like that, and it's a little tiny picky thing. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that's something you, it seems to me you have to have a way of responding to. Actually, the more interesting uh, issue that came up around Mother India came up in Japan. And I think actually this caused me to do something. I mean, you know, this fact and that fact is wrong. Actually, it was funny. When I was in Perth lecturing in Australia, the dinner party was in Melbourne, and I lectured in Perth. And uh, this guy wrote this article. I go, well, at least he's telling. He's saying how everybody, how a lot of these people built it. The headline of the article is Judy Chicago is wrong. <laughs> I go, that's basically, you know, I mean, <laughs> we can get right down to it. That's basically what most people are saying. I'm wrong about this fact, or I'm wrong about this. So what was I wrong about? I was wrong that Mary Wollstonecraft, did, I said she died in childbirth. And he said, no, she didn't die in childbirth. She died two months later from complications of childbed fever. I don't give me a break. <laughs> right? For two months, the woman was sick, and then she died. You know? <laughs> so I think that the facts, you know, the specific facts are, are, are not uh, uh, as big a consequence. After all, I never said it on the scholar. I'm an artist, you know, so there's some amount, there has to be some amount of uh, leniency in there. Uh, 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 symbolically true, that's a different issue. But in Japan, this woman stood up and she talked about the problem of a uh, white American woman trying to deal with or express the cultural experiences uh, be outside of her own experience. Okay. Well, so here's, here one is between a rock and a hard place. If one doesn't try, then one is ethnocentric, chauvinist, you know, and trying to universalize your experience to the point that it uh, uh, obscures other experiences. And if you do try, you make mistakes, you know, because on the other hand, she said, why don't you go around the world and help other women uh, make their art? 
again, it's like attributing incredible, I mean, power and money and resources beyond what any single artist ever would have. I mean, I can't do that. So the best I can do is try and use my imagination with as much integrity and hope that my intention is sufficiently honorable that people will respond to that even if I don't do it perfectly well. Um, this is a little bit off uh, the subject matter. I was, in your presentation last night, I was both amazed and flattered at the amount of insight that you showed toward the male struggle, which is, quote, starting to come out of the closet. Um, I was wondering philosophically, where did some of those influences come from? Is that from significant male people you know? Is that your own inner journey toward the young? What, uh, how do you attribute that? Well, you mean power play. And, right. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, I had, uh, I've had very, very deep relationships with men and sorry, with my father. So I've, um, certainly always known about the capacity for men to be human beings, you know, to be um, able to act beyond their gender. I think men, by and large, have not, really, most men have not begun to examine how gender constructs have shaped their behavior, and I think men are very, most men are very resistant to it. They prefer to believe the myth that they're all individuals, and it's only women who've been shaped by gender ideas and roles. That's one thing. Um, doing power play was definitely um, a journey for me. But as my former executive director, Sue Flower, said, I tend to think through, I think through ideas by making art. It was really a journey for me because I started out with images that were just real angry images about men, you know, angry at the way they acted, anger about the way they, uh, what they were doing in the world anger of their unconsciousness and their destructiveness. But at a certain point, I said, well, you know, and I, oh, wait a minute. You know, why do they act like this? I mean, there's got to be some human reasons. And then I began to actually try and penetrate that. And I think what I discovered, and it really sort of shocked me. And then I tried it out with some of my male friends and relatives, and it was that underneath that was just unbelievable despair. Despair and lack of hope and a feelings like there's no alternative, this is the way the world is, you simply have to tough it out. And that, that made me feel really, really bad, actually, for men. I mean, really bad. On the other hand, if they don't want to come in touch with it, there's not a goddamn thing I can do, you know, I'm sick and I can't. There's no dialogue until they come in touch with that. And then my husband, actually, was the one who um, inspired Woman, because he said that I had made so many images for women, alternative images, and that men had very few images of alternative places to be, and if I could do it, it would really be a gift. Well, that was pretty hard for me, because I go, oh, who wants it? I don't feel like giving them a gift. They treated me like shit. Anyway, no. <laughs> but, you know, I feel like uh, it was a reach for me, but I feel really good about it, and in fact, a lot of men have really responded to that image. Woman, there was a lot of men who responded to this, and cast paper pieces in that series, and a lot of men own them. So I found that incredibly reinforcing. But I think it's, you know, you have to, one has to uh, get to a certain point before one can get over one's own hurt to be able to hear about somebody else's hurt. And also, Karen Keller just gave me this book about the way men and women speak, you know, so in ways that they don't hear each other. So, I mean, I'm looking forward to, I'm hoping actually that, that even though I think Robert Bly and all this chest beating is you know, some, somewhat excessive, I'm hoping that, you know, in that process, men will begin to speak to each other about how much hurt they carry around and what price they're paying for power. I don't think men have even begun to come to terms with that. Um, well, I guess one of the, the, the soft philosophical challenges I would have for you is you talk a lot about the white male, and I look at why I look at the history, and I don't know that. That's I'm a white male, and I wouldn't look at that as being indicative of, of me as a white male. And there, there's a part of me that I know 20 years ago my reaction toward the feminist movement was, 
well, you, you're not giving us an alternative any better than the patriarchs are giving us. Um, I, I really enjoyed the, the redefinition that I got last night of feminism because I thought it was a lot more about what being a human being was about. Um, but just the challenge I would have for you is, I, I don't know how to, how to do that necessarily, but in my own language, I'm using the white male stuff because it's not all white males. I mean, for, for a long time it was, you know, males rape. Well, no, not all males rape, a very small percentage. And males get raped also, which is not creeping in to consciousness that- Yeah, the males male get raped primarily by men. Um, and also women. 97% the, the of all rapes are committed by men. Right, and you're looking at statistics. How many men are going to come up and say I've been raped by a woman? I, I, I dealt with I dealt with adolescent males, and even get them to u utilize the term mm -hmm. and indoctrinate in their space about sexual abuse they've been sexually abused. Mm -hmm. Take is a long, long, hard process. Yeah, no. Just because of the sheer denial, and I think our media, as well as statistics, is the analytical part of the maleness that keeps us all in denial, and. You know, I, I guess I utilize statistics, you know, my own philosophy of time, but I'm also real careful to say that comes out of the analytical stuff, and most of that stuff is born out of straight denial. We know very little about our human experience because it's not even talked about. Probably that. Agree with that sure. and, and males, I think, you know, we talk about abuse towards women and, and children. The most prolific known abuse in the world right now is towards males, and it's like, I, I, I think it's I think it's very important not to get into who's victimization is worse. Right. Okay, I think that's really important because what happens is it sets up a competition. And what we want to do is we want to make space for everybody's story to be heard. Whatever that story is, okay? And on the scale of one to 10 in victimization, it doesn't, I mean, you know. So I would say that um, my husband has had similar difficulties in being able to uh, come to grips with what his gender has done. And actually, when we were doing the research in the Holocaust, it was very hard for Donald because, you know, one of the unspoken facts about the Holocaust is that the, all the architects of the Third Reich were men. There was not woman involved in making policy. Okay, just like all the architects of the world we live in are men. Women participate, are complicitous, and we can discuss forever how, what happens in terms of values and blah, blah, blah. But, it was extremely difficult for him as a man to look at it full in the face. Because he understood, actually, that the way in which the Nazis excised feeling, compassion, sympathy, and human response from their makeup was related to the way men are brought up to think what it means to be a man. I mean, you read these things that this guy Kramer, who uh, was the commandant of one of the gas chamber, of one of the camps, said when he looks into the, cha you know, the gas chamber people, and he sees everybody dead, and he says, I had no feelings. I had absolutely no feelings. And you go, I'm a man. He says, I'm a guy. He says that out loud. And you go, ah. and so for Donald, it was just excruciating because he wanted to make a distinction between himself as a human individual and what his gender had done. And I think that's what you're talking about. And I think that one of the things uh, we as women have to do is to make it sufficiently understandable that the issue here is values. Values. And if you got the same values I got, I don't care what gender you are. And if you don't got the same values I got, I don't care what gender you are. Because the issue here is a redefinition of power and a transformation of values on the planet. And I think that that has been unclear in terms of the women's movement. However, I think it's very difficult for men to accept leadership from women and to accept giving up control and power to the point that they will accept the idea that women have, in fact, pioneered and engineered some strategies for a new way of being and a new way of acting that can be liberating for everybody. Now, my husband is somebody who's accepted that. He's accepted that. And he finds he's, he's very comfortable calling himself a feminist, being around feminists, and uncomfortable with people who are not, whether they're men or women. And sometimes they're women who think feminism is just another uh, 
way to get power. Because this well, time it's going to be for them. Birth might have been something in that name too. He was born out of male. No, it was always no. Actually, originally it wasn't. Originally, it was complete. It was the idea was to challenge the entire. That's not at all what it was originally. I know, because I was, I mean, in the second wave, I was one of the originators, so I know it wasn't that. I keep saying, we never had enough money. And it, but when was that one? was some more, so, 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 so two women could get into the Ocaselli Gallery. That wasn't our idea. <laughs> our idea was to change the relationship of art to culture. Can I ask you some, you were mentioning that there were some press paper pieces that were owned by, by men. Um, tell me about how diverse uh, the ownership is of your work. So I, when I go to museums, I don't see anything. Is it that they're not being bought up by people who are donating them? What's happening? Well, no. Uh, the ownership of, well, the Birth Project is owned almost entirely by Through the Flower. I gave it away, the whole project. And uh, uh, Through the Flower places works in, around the country and institutions. So there are Birth Project works in permanent installations around the country. Uh, and my work is owned, it's a lot of it is owned privately. The, there's a painting by, uh, in the Women's Museum, it's on extended loan. Through the Flower is on extended loan there by the woman who owns it. Uh, by and large, the people who own my work are the same people who supported my work. They're not the people who, you know, um, control culture or participate primarily in culture. And my work is certainly in the collections of some work. But you know, that's what I was talking about last night about, about the, you know, how I'm not exactly in the mainstream. But I, it's very striking to me that, that you aren't. So it's very strange and odd, right? It's not really strange and odd, is it? I mean, it, it, it is and it isn't. It's just unfair. <laughs> that's what you really mean. <laughs> <laughs> it, just, it just seems like it, it's, it's a definition of our lack of, of importance. Well, it's a definition of what empowerment is defined. And don't, don't, uh, I keep saying this, that there's a big difference between changing people's lives and uh, getting into history. I work in India, so I What? I work a little bit in India, in the art industry. And I'm struck by the difference between a uh, major difference there are kinds of art and here, the same difference. That's so why you go to other places and I'll yeah. back. There's gallery art there, just like gallery art here, except for the wildest kind of things. Every kind of painting or sculpture we have, they have, they read some of the same magazines, mm -hmm. they workshop back and forth. That art is like most of our gallery art, most of what we call modern art, contemporary art, it's about alienation, right? The individual distinguishing themselves from everybody and everything and putting out whatever feelings they have as mine. Mm -hmm. Then there's the art that people do that has to do with a certain community. Mm -hmm. You know, I would say it, it could be women's art, it could be, I think, a group of Buddhists mm -hmm. in India, Buddhism develops it. They start being Buddhist art, it's not going to go in the museum, it's going to go to that community. The relationship between the artist and the rest of the world and their community is one of, I'm sharing these with myself, with my community, I belong to it, this is about us, as opposed to, this is about me and nobody else. It may be about my pain that I can't be like everybody else. But your art doesn't aim at that alienated level, which is what our galleries are about. It's well, a totally specific kind of people. Well, that's probably one of the reasons you can't find it in museums. But I agree with you, the prevailing modern ethic is about alienation. But you see, uh, I'm, about to, I'm going to do a talk soon called Is It Art or Politics? in which I'm going to examine why certain art is considered political and other art is not considered political. For example, why are the politics of alienation considered universal? That's what virtual art culture is about. Yeah. But you see this tremendous unconsciousness about this. It's when a particular point of view is elevated to the universal and everybody accepts it unthinkingly and doesn't examine it. Uh, the other thing I'm uh, thinking about too a lot now is I'm, uh, thinking maybe I'm going to teach for a little while when I finish the Holocaust Project. And uh, one thing I'm interested in is um, trying to find a, develop a different way for artists to learn how to first identify themselves and then interact with the community. So that, for example, since the art community has been so under siege, you know, uh, it has drawn in very pace. It's become even more small and isolated than it never was before. 
also, of course, the reason it could be under siege is it's so cut off from the wellsprings of the larger community that people really don't understand why art is important. That's the first thing. So, you know, they don't understand what it means when art is under assault. And, uh, um, but I'm thinking a lot about trying to uh, <coughs> figure out some kind of curriculum that helps young artists learn to be artists in a different way. One that actually helps them engage in the community and interact with the community and find out whether their work, their making, means anything to them, except to them. And I think that, you know, because I had to find an alternative route because I was so, you know, discriminated against as a young woman artist, I went around the country and showing my slides and I have these conversations with 300 people. Well, you understand this? You know, what do you think of this? And it was fascinating. I and mean, I got all this feedback that actually allowed me to inform my imagery in a way that made it, what I was looking for was a way to maintain a high level of quality and the integrity of the history of art while making it more accessible. It took me a lot of years of focused work and some of it meant opening myself to a level of dialogue that most artists never, ever allow or hear. So you know, they don't understand why nobody supports them, they're not interested in them. I mean, I go to these galleries, there's not a soul in them. You know, I go, oh, huh, who cares? I mean, and that's what's also being produced in the schools. I mean, a lot of art that nobody cares about. The thing about dialogue, it just seems to me most of the artists I've interviewed, I started interviewing, say, well, I don't care what they think about it. I don't care what they understand about it. I know what I'm saying. Right. And they will deeply feel it. <laughs> uh, but it's like I'm not doing it for them. I'm doing it for me. Well, you know, some of that's a learned stance. I mean, that's part of, the you know, stance. right. I mean, there's a certain kind of uh, professional stance, you know, sort of like um, that everybody learns when they're becoming a doctor or they're becoming a, a scientist or becoming a this or a that, an engineer. Well, artists learn it too. You know, the art's supposed to speak for itself. This means that somebody is going to write about you in art forum or art in America and then you're going to pretend the art is speaking for itself and that there hasn't been an article elucidating the art. I mean, it's really quite laughable if it weren't so serious, but it is serious because art is, are the value-laden icons of the society and they, and what's passed on shapes the way you see reality and so it's a very serious battle actually. To, to, to challenge the canon, and part of it comes from artists thinking through some of this. I mean, all these artists are coming out of school and can't make a living. I mean, it's, it, you know, they're, they're, they work they work in the frame shops, they work as waitresses, they do everything except think about what they have been taught about what it means to be an artist and whether there's an alternative way. And to tell you the truth, one of the things I must say that has been disappointing to me is the way in which younger artists, especially younger women artists, have not used the information in my career for ways, alternative ways to make the artists. Because after all, I, I managed to work for 30 years uninterrupted in my studio, full time, 60 hours a week as an artist. Isn't that every artist's dream? I didn't work as a waitress. I didn't work at a frame shop. I worked as an artist. And I did it by building a base of support because people care about my work, care enough to want to see me keep working. I think, I mean, what more can an artist want in life except to get into history books? <laughs> <laughs> so if I, if I said you were, you were creating myths in a way you didn't create them alone, you were creating them in conversation with these people. Well, the thing is that I think that myths have to reflect the larger community consciousness or they have no meaning. If all you're making is a private myth that's impenetrable, who's going to care about that? And why should they, actually? Your dealer would sell it, but otherwise. <laughs> I always say, you know, but of course, this is all contributed to the international art market where uh, works of art can be bought and sold without the content ever intruding on your consciousness. Because, you know, if, you're, if you are uh, the owner of a company that has investments in South Africa, you do not want to buy a painting that deals with apartheid or the oppression of blacks because it might ding your consciousness that maybe you shouldn't be doing this because there's human consequences for your actions. So you'd rather buy something that's nice and abstract or all blue or, you know, about form and space and color and line or thrust or light or something equally alienated and meaningless, basically. 
This is not a popular position in the air. <laughs> but you've had a few chances. Let's see if somebody else wants to say something. Who hasn't uh, asked anything yet? My 18 year old daughter came last night to the talk. She's pretty aware of the research going on. She's very excited about the hearing your explanation of your mom and heart and about seeing a kind of role model that she could identify with. Um, you, you talk about in the future you thinking of talking more about how to transfer ideas, transformation of values to young artists and just you know, people as generous. And uh, I just would like to hear you say more about that. I work in artists and schools program in this state. And a lot of times a uh, young artist in the schools don't hear any alternative ideas until an artist 